Hi, I'm Riley. And I'm Ryder. And, and this, this is, is my dad's, dad's show. show. Hey, everybody. It's Casey Jaycox with The Quarterback DadCast. I want to say thanks to all of our listeners. Thanks to all of our sponsors for all your support. Uh, we are continuing to enjoy this journey together, inspiring dads. But I want to take a minute now to talk about Acme Homes. You've heard me talk about him before, but I'm going to talk about him again. Bob Cumming, former college teammate, amazing leader, amazing uh, home builder. They continue to take so much pride in the work they do, the craftsmanship, the attention to detail. Whether you're looking for a home up in Monroe, uh, up in Sultan, up in Wenatchee, this is where they're doing their amazing things. So many people during the pandemic, as we have the ability to work from home, have decided to move out of the city to try to find homes where there's more acreage. Well, that's exactly what Bob and team at Acme Homes give you. So check out Valley Vista up in Monroe. Check out Daisy Meadows out in Sultan. And if you want to even go to Eastern Washington, check out Sienna Heights in Wenatchee. They're, again, amazing craftsmanship, amazing floor plans. You can visit them at acmehomeswa.com. And if you're interested in learning specifically about uh, listings or uh, mortgage opportunities, contact Jen at 425-308. 8082 or Denise at 425-309-2318. So now, why are we doing a new ad? Because we want to talk about a partnership they have with Portage Bank. Kevin Jensen is one of the great lenders over there. He's a senior vice president. He's going to take care of you. And right now, if you obtain a mortgage through Portage Bank, uh, Bob and team and Acme Homes are going to pay f your $500 appraisal fee. I said that right. They're going to pay your $500 appraisal fee by buying a home through them, Getting your mortgage through the folks at Portage Bank. So don't don't wait. Now's the time to, to contact Jen. Contact Denise again. Jen's number is 425-308-8082. And again, Denise is at 425-309-2318. So visit acmehomeswa.com right now to go visit and learn about your next new home. Hey everybody, it's Casey Jaycox with the Quarterback Dadcast. We are in season three, and as you, uh, if you listen to this podcast, you know that every episode in season three is dedicated to the Mike Jaycox, my pops, who passed away on December 29th. We're dedicating every episode to him. So pops, I hope you're doing well up in heaven or wherever the heck you are. I hope you're having fun and laughing. And um, Our next guest is someone I'm very, very excited to talk to. I was, uh, I, I heard about uh, him, Mr. Anthony Anderson, on uh, the Revenue Builders Podcast, which is a new podcast run by a, a mentor of mine, a guy named John Kaplan, and a gentleman by the name of John McMahon, who I have not yet met. Uh, hopefully, I will have a chance to meet him in the future. And uh, they interviewed Anthony, and they talked about a lot of cool things. They talked about uh, a documentary called Almost Sunrise. They talked about Project Welcome Home Troops. They talked about meditation, mindset. They talked about, even at the end, something called Lit Beard, which we'll learn about that. I know what it is. Um, but... I learned uh, the story of Anthony and the story of um, what this documentary is about and the story about uh, just his journey is super powerful. And I hope that when we talk about Anthony today, we're going to not only talk about all these things, but we're also going to talk about Anthony, the dad, how he's working hard to become that ultimate quarterback or leader of his household. Um, so I hope when we get done talking to Anthony today, I hope you guys are more aware and, and you're motivated to, to get uh, more involved and, and support our troops. Um, so without further ado, Mr. Anderson, welcome to the Quarterback Dadcast. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Cool. So we always start um, uh, each episode with gratitude. So tell me, what are you most grateful for as a father today? Um, I have to say, honestly, uh, it might be a little bit cliched, but when I woke up this morning, um, my little three-year-old daughter, Hazel, was sleeping next to me and she was dreaming, but she was speaking while she was dreaming. So um, I, I woke up pretty grateful, uh, straight away just to wake up and kind of be snuggling with my little daughter. It's something that, um, I enjoy quite a bit. You always want them to kind of grow up and be in their own bed in their own rooms and stuff like that. But, um, I was grateful just for that little bit of snuggle time this morning, kind of listening to those dream nonsense words. Uh, <laughs> she started her day with. Oh, I love that. You brought me back to my kids are a little older than yours. I have a 16 year old and a 13 year old, but I remember my daughter used to do the same stuff. She would almost be like these weird, like moaning, weird, high pitched kind of things. And so cute. And, um, I'm going to go completely opposite Anthony. Okay. Uh, I am grateful. My, so my wife and daughter are out of town. 
Uh, they're playing at a basketball tournament. My daughter broke her finger pretty bad. So she's out for a significant time. My, my son is, it's just me and him. We're home together. And two nights ago, he and I watched Anchorman 2 together <laughs> and just pure shenanigans. And I, for, I'd not, I, I'm a big Will Ferrell guy, but I did not realize how funny Anchorman 2 was. And I, we had, we were literally laughing about it today still. Like, and I saw him and just the stupid one liners and just like having a sense of humor that you're obviously my son. So he gets it from me, but it was so fun. I'm just so grateful for that. Just slowing down to realize that, you know, we get, we get caught up in the race, but remember like just, you know, like you slowing down to enjoy the small things, mean the small things. It's that's what it's about. Super fun. I dig that one. That's a good one too. I, I have an older daughter uh, who's 10. Um, so I enjoy kind of exposing her when I can uh, to some of the movies or, you know, the clips or the songs or whatever that, that I really like. So I can, uh, I can appreciate you sharing uh, some Will Ferrell comedy with, with your kid <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's the best. It's the best. Um, okay. So before we get into um, all the great stuff you're working on, I'd love to kind of rewind the tape and just talk to me about what was life like growing up for Anthony. And um, talk sure. about how your parents and family impacted you and kind of what you're doing now. Sure. Um, so I grew up in southeastern Wisconsin, maybe 45 minutes north of Milwaukee. So, uh, you know, sports, Packers, Brewers, Bucks, you know, Wisconsin Badgers, all that sort of stuff. Um, always enjoyed watching that. So that was um, something I enjoyed doing, you know, as a young man, love going out, being in nature um, hiking, fishing. I mean, the amount of days I used to just, uh, bungee cord a tackle box to the back of my bike and just ride around with my fishing pole, um, hop rocks, you know, figure out where I could, you know, catch anything and just spend my time doing that. Um, I love doing that. Of course, as a kid played, you know, little league, played football, stuff like that. Um, my dad was a school teacher. Um, and my mom worked in a nursing home. So I went to, um, I went to the grade school where my dad was a teacher. He was a Catholic grade school. I went there from kindergarten through eighth grade. And then I went to an all boys, uh, Jesuit high school in Milwaukee. So it was about a 45, 60 minute drive down to high school every day. Wow. Um, in downtown Milwaukee, um, played football, wrestled, you know, did the normal kind of high school the high school thing. Um, but yeah, my dad was school teacher. He was my fifth and sixth grade science teacher. So that was definitely a, a different experience uh, when you have your dad as your, uh, <laughs> as your science teacher. Um, but to that point, um, it really gave me an appreciation for what teachers did because there were many times when um, like my dad was never the sort of teacher that was using the tests that came with the books. He was one where he'd be making his own and his own worksheets and stuff like that and really trying to get down to like, are, you know, are the students learning it? So I would be seeing the amount of hours my dad was putting in, what time he was getting to the school before it started, what time he was getting back when he was done, the number of phone calls, how late he was taking phone calls from students or parents, um, you know, into the evening. I wasn't getting much help with my stuff because my dad was always helping um, other kids, but when I was growing up, the neighborhood that I was in, um, full of kids, I mean, playing football on the street, the sort of thing where your mom would be yelling, you know, across the neighbor, you know, neighbor's lawns, like it's time to come in for dinner and you're just jamming, you know, food into your mouth so you can get back out and keep playing and stuff like that. So um, it's pretty fun, pretty, I think, pretty fortunate to grow up where I did. Um, I went to college in um, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a grade six or 12 English teacher. So teaching was real big in my family. Um, ever since I was a little kid, service has been a big um, lesson. Um, like my, like I said, my dad was a teacher. My mom worked in a nursing home. The joke was always, he takes care of the old, you know, the young, she takes care of the old. My mm -hmm. grandma was mayor of her tiny little town in southwestern Wisconsin, you know, plenty of um, other teachers and nurses and stuff like that in my family. So really taking care of people and being of service to your community is a big thing. So I went to school to be a high school English teacher. I want to be a grade six through 12 English teacher, not because I particularly care about uh, 
proper comma placement or, you know, your adverbial phrases. I like to read and then I like to discuss the themes in the literature and where we see them in our regular, like everyday life. So I always liked the canonical text. I like the the classics. And then I like to say, you know, and kind of go through, hey, this was something that they were talking about and dealing with three, four hundred years ago. We're still seeing this, you know, right. in our regular, you know, everyday life in society. So that really interested me. But my first or second week of college, uh, 9-11 attacks happened. And that was kind of like the final push that got me to join the military. Um, I had gone in to speak to a recruiter when I was like 16. I wanted to be a Marine. My grandfather, my dad's dad was a Marine. Um, and I just thought that they had cool uniforms and were, you know, like generally badass. Worst recruiter of all time. Didn't tell me anything fun. Didn't say you're going to go here, do this, you know, shoot these big guns or anything like that. It was just like, we are going to grind you into the dirt. We are just going to destroy you, you know, destroy your life every day. And I was like, I'm 16. Like, tell me something. Right. Fun. <laughs> Nothing. So um, I had kind of put that on the back burner, but I always knew like this is something that interests me. So when the 9-11 attacks happened, that was kind of like that final push. So I finished up my um, freshman year of college um, and then I enlisted and um, I knew that I, st I wanted to serve, but I also knew that I wanted to try to figure out exactly what that service was going to look like. So did I want to do it full time as a career? Did I want to finish school and kind of do the, you know, like I didn't know. So I was trying to trying to figure out the right way. So I joined um, the Wisconsin National Guard and enlisted as an infantryman. And I went to Fort Benning, Georgia um, for basic training. And um, my entire kind of like plan was I'll join the guard, I'll finish school, and then I'll either teach or I'll go into the military full time. Um, so I was 19 when I enlisted. And um, as you know, life tends to do like your plans and reality don't exactly play out. Um, so after I got out of basic training, um, I met uh, this girl who uh, became my wife. We just had our 18 year wedding anniversary last week. Congratulations. So we've been married for, yeah, thank you. So we've been married uh, for quite a while. But um, a month after we got married, I then deployed to Iraq. Uh, the first time. So this would have been in uh, the summer of 2004. Um, and I deployed to Baghdad, Iraq, or I was stationed at Camp Liberty in southwest Baghdad, just doing infantry stuff, going out on patrol, doing security for like when our battalion commander would want to go out and, you know, he's got to meet with some local cleric or he wants to go, you know, kind of check in with the other units in our in our battalion, um, provide his security. First round of free elections where the Iraqis were all dipping their fingers in purple ink and showing that they voted, providing security during that time. So just a very unique time to be a young man um, engaged in that. Came home, um, tried to get back into the swing of things. But again, like I had just been married. So um, trying to pick up being a young married couple, but also a young veteran having just returned as well as a young man still trying to figure out where he wants to go and what he wants to do. And after being home for a year and a half, I volunteered to go back. Um, and I was stationed a little north of Baghdad, about an hour north, um, doing convoy escort. So any of your listeners that are veterans, um, family members or friend of, friends of veterans, they know what convoy escort is. But if you don't, um, the Iraq war was full of contractors and the contractors would fix our vehicles, deliver our mail, whatever it might be. So they had to get from base to base. And so um, convoy escort was like, Hey, these contractors are going to deliver ice mail, ammo and helicopter parts. And they're going to go from here to here to here to here. And you have to provide their security. So I would provide their security all the way around through Baghdad and then just come back to my base and stuff like that. So, um, did that until 2008, got out, um, returned back to southeastern Wisconsin. So um, it's kind of a, you know, pretty broad overview of kind of growing up and stuff like that. But southeastern Wisconsin is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much in my DNA. I am, uh, you know, I'm a Midwestern guy, you know, I mean, this is, 
I've been, you know, able and fortunate to live in other places, Florida, Texas, you know, been around the world a couple times and stuff like that. This is home. When I was in Iraq, I was always, uh, I remember many times thinking like, man, it would just be great to be able to like pop my shoes off and stand in like the grass of home. Wow. Um, and so every time I leave here, I feel very drawn back to it. So yeah, this is where I'm from. This is where I like to be. Um, the things that I love to do are all based right here. Love it. I would love if my memory's correct from your story, from watching the, the documentary and then hearing your story with, um, on the revenue builders, the story when you first deployed is. Yeah. When I volunteered. As, right. It wasn't, I would say <laughs> sure. that would be a little uncommon. Sure. So let me provide a little bit of context. So the military is kind of, you have reservists, which can be literally known as the reserves or the national guard. And then you have your regular full-time active duty. So like I mentioned to you, I, I was on the reservist side. So uh, stereotypically we're the one weekend a month, two weeks a year drilling, but you get deployed, you get activated and stuff like that. So the difference um, for your regular active duty people is they're doing their military job 24, seven, 365. When their units are deploying, they're going with, similar in the guard other than you know it's part-time you go to school or you have a job you know you live at home and then you go to your unit but when it's time to deploy there's a couple ways that this can happen your unit that you're a part of um, can deploy um, with your state or your unit could be selected and used to fill a deficiency from another unit in another state or you can volunteer as an individual and they'll say, cool, Sergeant Anderson, um, thank you very much for volunteering. This unit over here is going to deploy. They're short, you know, your job and your rank. We'd like to put you over there. So what you're alluding to is um, I had just done my first two weeks a year. So one week in a month, two weeks a year training. I had just finished my two weeks a year um, training and they, um, the company command pulled me into an office and they said, you've been involuntarily mobilized. And so what that means is a unit somewhere was deploying and they were short of people. And they said, this guy right here fits the description of what we need. We're taking them. So they said, hey, we know you're getting married. You should probably get married. You've got about a month to get all of your affairs in order and then you're deploying. So I had about an hour drive home. And um, I hadn't talked to my family yet, but a couple people that I had, you know, was close to, I was kind of letting them know. And one of those people was my battle buddy from basic training. So I called him, his name was Mike. And I was like, hey, Mike, so um, how are things going? And he's like, oh, I just got into the school I wanted to be in and um, just moved in uh, to this house with my girlfriend. Um, things are going really well. Like, how are things going with you? And I was like, well, man, I just got involuntarily mobilized. I'm going to be deploying. I don't know if it'll be to Afghanistan or Iraq, but pretty soon I'll be going. And he was like, wow, that sucks. But I'll be thinking of you, um, you know, stay in touch. It's a great. I hung up. I get a call from my unit a couple minutes later and they're like, Anthony, um, have you told anybody that you're deploying yet? And I said, no, not really. Just a couple of people. Why? And they said, well, there's been a mistake. Um, we're not you're not going to be going. Um you're actually, you have too much rank. We're looking for somebody who's like a private. Um, we're not going to take you. Um, uh, <laughs> isn't that nice? And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. Um, th and at that time you'd get a lot of like false alerts, like, oh, I'm going to go, or my unit's about to go. There was always kind wow. of, that was happening. Well, I get off the phone with them a couple of minutes later, Mike calls me up. Guess what? I'm now going um, so this is Mike talking. I'm now the one going, um, they just involuntarily mobilized me. Now I'll be deploying in your place. And I said to him, I was like, Mike, um, you know, that sucks, man. But you know, we did basic training together. Um, I don't think you should do this by yourself. Let me see what I can do. Like, you know, maybe we can go together or something like that. And he's like, okay, you know, just do your thing. So I hang up with him. I call my unit back and I say, Hey, by coincidence, you just selected my battle buddy from basic training um, to take my place. And I don't exactly feel all that comfortable with you just, you know, taking him and plugging him in when it should have been me. 
all volunteer to go with him. And they said, are you sure that you want to do this? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I want to do it. I had already just kind of started conditioning my mind to accept that this was happening. So I said, okay, we'll take care of it. Hang up with them. A couple of minutes later, get another phone call from Mike. And he's like, dude, guess what? Some idiot just volunteered. I don't have to go anymore. That idiot was me. So I went uh, in his place. I was one of uh, 13, I think it was 13 individuals from the state of Wisconsin uh, that was selected and kind of put together as like a little hodgepodge unit um, sent off to Texas for training. And then we filled deficiencies uh, for another state. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of the breaks of it, right? Like the military's core values, uh, they kind of spell out leadership, L-D-R-S-H-I-P, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And so for me, I felt like that was the right thing to do. I felt like that was kind of like my duty and my responsibility to him, even though it would be uncomfortable, even though I'd be leaving my friends and my family and the things that matter to me. Um, you know, you still have that mindset of duty and selflessness and kind of the, you know, the right thing to do. Um, ironically enough, this was not the last time that I would volunteer. And this was not the last time that the people that I was uh, going to be going with got um, changed up. The second time I went, I had kind of made a little pact with people and said, you know, if two or more of us get involuntarily mobilized, the rest of us will volunteer. And uh, when that did happen, um, I think three guys were involuntarily mobilized and the balance didn't volunteer. Only I did. And for whatever reason, one guy's dad had just died and we're like, totally get it. Like your family needs it at home. Another guy was about to get married. I was like, that's not a good excuse, man. I did this, you know, too, but, um, i I volunteered. And so I went with the guys who were involuntarily mobilized. And while we were processing all of our paperwork, they were all disqualified. <laughs> and so I got taken as an individual again. Um, and they all went home for one reason or another. Maybe they had, you know, they were medically, you know, incapable of going or something like what, that. Now what's, when this is happening, what's, cause no, I knew the story, right? Yeah. I've heard it yeah. twice now. This is the third time I've heard it. I still am like, oh my God, what's going to happen? I'm like right in this character. Like I'm watching the movie again, but I forgot the ending, but I'm still asking because I'm so curious. And I love <laughs> it. And you're a great storyteller. Yeah. When no, you're thanks. going through this personally, like at what point are you like, holy, pardon my French, holy shit. Seriously? Again? Like did any part of your mindset like kind of like, or you just like, so like, this is what I'm supposed to do. Let's go. Yeah. So a lot of people have asked me like why I volunteered to go back. It's very difficult to explain, but you, like I was mentioning to you before, kind of like that feeling of like duty and responsibility. Like there's plenty of people, like the war is still going on. Why should somebody have to go for their fourth or fifth time? I'm physically able and mentally able and I'm experienced. I've done it. Like, why shouldn't it be me? There's nothing inherently special about me. The only people, the military, you know, puts us into you. The only person that really, you're not a unique snowflake. The only person that really cares about you is your mom, maybe your dad. But otherwise, like there's nothing special about you. Like, go. I had signed up for it. I knew that it was difficult. But as I was going through it, I just felt like, I felt two things. One, like I had not completed my service from my first deployment. Two, I had given my word to these people that I mm -hmm. would do this. Um, and so that mattered to me whether or not they did or not. Now, to your point, when you say like, well, how, what are you thinking in that moment? You think a million things. You think, oh, shit, should I really have done this? Or like, man, in six months from now, I'm going to be, you know, right back in country. Um, man, I this is going to sound crazy. You say, well, damn, I hope they send me back to Iraq and not to like Kuwait or somewhere boring. You know, like you start to think all of these different um, these different things. But really, to me, at that time, when I volunteered to go back, um, I was 23 or 24. I was 24 when I was back in country, but maybe I was about 23 and I volunteered. You're still pretty young. You still make a lot of decisions quite impulsively. Even when they're rooted in something, it's quick. Um, I just felt like I was doing the right thing, even though people around me that cared about me would have felt otherwise and subsequently told me that. 
I felt like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Powerful stuff, ma'am. Thank you for your service. Thank you for sharing the story. It's, um, it just like it, when I, I want to get into, I want to get into, um, uh, almost sunrise amazing documentary on Amazon prime. Everybody must watch from a father's perspective going through that. Like you, your family's of service. You, you talked about that's where a lot of this was kind of bred in you. Like of these stories, how, how much do your, does your 10 year old know? Will you share with your three year old? Like, yeah, these are, so these are excellent questions. Um, I had no kids when I deployed and I felt very fortunate that I had no kids because I saw some of these guys that were deploying be away from their kids and how just incredibly painful it was. Like it's difficult to be away from a wife or a girlfriend or a husband or a significant other or whatever. But when you're away from your kids, it's, uh, it's like another level. And I saw that. So as a young man, I felt very fortunate to not have that weight on me when I was deployed. I look at one of the benefits of having walked to California from Wisconsin, having this documentary about it as a cool artifact that will help Madeline, who was, when you see the film, this is, she's now 10, but she was a year and a half turned two while I was walking. Hazel wasn't even born, Mm -hmm. but it's a cool artifact, I think, for them to know why they were raised the way that they were who their dad was, what motivated him, you know, because it's most of these things are done anecdotally, you know, this is my story or somebody else is telling them about their dad or how they, this is something that they get to see. I mean, Mm -hmm. literally they get to see this journey. They get to be a part of it. Even if they weren't born or physically there, they get to understand how, especially Madeline, since she was born, how much I was thinking about her and how much, she had motivated me to do this because I didn't feel like I was living up to my obligations as a dad. Um, But one thing, Casey, that's very key in having done this walk is the people that we met along the way um, as like kids of veterans talking about how their, their, you know, their dad or their brother or their loved one's service affected them growing up. This gave me a very, very, important lens to see the world through and my role as a dad and a, you know, as a parent and as a spouse through, Mm -hmm. um, because again, going back to that earlier thing, like of not being special, there is nothing that says that this person's experience over here, like I'm not going to have the same failures. Very often what I saw was meeting people that had gone through the same life journey, but they were 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years farther down the line. And so it was helpful for me to see like, there's my future. Hey everybody, it's Casey Jaycox. I want to take a quick break to talk about my friends up at Catch Sicka Seafoods who continue to be just an amazing loyal sponsor. And for those that you've tried it, thank you. For those of you who haven't, you're missing out. And now's the time to make sure that you visit catchsickaseafoods.com and get some of those amazing smoked salmon, get some of that amazing rockfish, blackfish, black cod, uh, salmon, whatever it might be, whatever you, you like. But what, what's great about opportunities they have, now's the time to subscribe to a box so that you're going to get that reliable cadence of the best fish directly from the dock to the doorstep. And what, what's great about Catch Sick Seafoods, they make it so easy. So those that maybe aren't the best chefs at home, who doesn't matter. They're going to give you this beautiful, uh, nice laminated uh, recipe card that tells you exactly how long to cook it, whether you're going to barbecue, you're going to bake, you're going to fry, whatever, whatever the way you want to do it, they're going to make it easy. So please visit them today, catch sick seafoods.com sign up for a subscription so that you know, you're going to get the best fish delivered directly to your door. You won't regret it. And just like my daughter Riley says, dad, I don't even like fish. And she does now because of my friends up at catch sick seafood. So with that, let's get right back to today's episode. I'm on yeah. the same path. I'll have those same fallout moments with my kids or I'll have those same fallout moments with my spouse. I don't want that. Let me hear from them and kind of take those lessons and apply what they've got. You know, like I said, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years worth of wisdom kind of built into it. Let me see if I can apply that and avoid some of those pitfalls. When you, so everybody, Anthony and I talk, Sergeant Anthony Anderson, we're talking about the, this, Almost Sunrise is about a documentary. Him and, him and his friend Tom Boss, if I have that correct. Yep. You, so if, 
and you probably heard him say from Milwaukee to California, I'm going to repeat that. He, they walked from Milwaukee to California. That's not like going around the block, everybody. That is a long way. And this documentary talks about it, talks about the decision to go. Um, and uh, it's just, it's super powerful and it's, it'll, it'll bring awareness. And if you're already curious about what our troops do, you'll be even more curious. You'll be, you're going to want to get involved. So please, please go, go watch this. Um, so when you're, cause now it's hard to believe. Cause then I, I just watched in my mind, Madeline is like the young, she's, she's not Hazel. Yeah. in my mind. I yeah. see her as this young little girl in the movie or the documentary. Yeah. When you were gone, did that give you a, an inter like a different viewpoint as a, from a father perspective on what life was like for some of your buddies that were, um, in Iraq or Afghanistan? Like, wow. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So like being away and, um, calling home and, you know, hoping that, you know, Madeline was up and I could talk to her, you know, kind of at this would have been 2013 when we were doing the walk. So some version of kind of like Skype, you know, stuff like that. Um, definitely I could empathize, um, with them. Uh, yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. And I feel too, you know, lucky that the technology that I had when I was deployed, it was a blessing and a curse. And I've, I've tried to explain this to people too, especially when you have loved ones that you're keeping in touch with back in the day when, you know, our parents and grandparents would have been deployed and fighting in wars. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have kind of like this quick turn, you know, service. So maybe a package was sent and it might take a month to get there. Um, you know, they get a phone call from time to time. A letter takes forever. Well, now we're logging on into chat rooms and we're doing all these different things. And the modern military, you're having to switch from soldier who's deployed who's just been out on a mission all day to now I'm chatting with my wife who is trying to figure out why the garage door won't go down. Do I need to contact the landlord? Hey, but the kid isn't listening. So I also need you to talk to the kid. And now I need to be a soldier, a husband, a dad, like all these different things. Wow. Like that's what a lot of guys and girls are going through now when they're deployed. Um, so it's great to be able to be connected but it's also a completely different experience and the different roles that you have to jump in and out of constantly where historically it's like, like those guys in world war two, they deployed, they're deployed for three years. Like we'll come back when the war is over. Now it's like you're deployed for a year, but you're jumping in between roles sometimes multiple times throughout the day. And that's, that's tough. When I was walking, cause obviously not apples to apples is being deployed, but that same thing. I was trying to take the time to address what I felt was holding me back. But at the same time, I didn't go radio silence with my wife and say, well, I'm leaving. Uh, I'll talk to you again when I get to California and we'll see what I've figured out. I'm maintaining that relationship. I'm talking about the same things. Sometimes I'm arguing about those same things. Sometimes I'm trying to share about something that I've, you know, it's been revealed about me or some new lesson I've learned that I want to try to apply differently within my life, all of these things in live time. Um, so it's very awesome to have that, but at the same time, it's also very complicated because uh, it's you're, you're progressing in live time. You're doing all these things in live time um, and it can be difficult to balance when you're trying to also cope with what's mm -hmm. happening around you. So it's what challenging. Are, what are some of the, um, and you, you shared this challenges, but like how do, how does someone in the military, uh, adapt to that new mindset of being able to be soldier? Wait, Hey, do you pay the babysitter? Like I can't, yeah. that is, that's like, you're having a job, but it's not like a normal job. That's totally unfair to, you know, so how do you get the right training to be in that mindset? I, I literally don't think that there's any training that goes into it. I think what happens is you have a good network of people around you that help you understand it, like begin living into it. Um, the military, you know, I'm not knocking him when I say this, the military is not there to help you learn how to be like a better dad and a better husband and stuff like they might have some programs or something to try to help you but that's not their role. When you like 
for me, I was very fortunate. I had good family um, that was very patient with me that if I was acting differently or um, maybe not very cooperatively, had patience with me, allowed me to try to figure out, you know, the right kind of path and way to communicate again. I think there's a couple things that need to happen. I think one, um, you need to be quite honest with yourself and you need to kind of defy the stereotype of like, I don't need help. Like, just tell people, like, I'm trying to figure out how to be, you know, a good dad or a good husband or a good wife or a good boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. One of the things that's difficult in the military is showing any sort of vulnerability. Like, you've got to do that. You just got, like, I don't mm -hmm. know what I'm doing. Like, you know, if you didn't know how to use a piece of equipment, they wouldn't think that you were, you know, totally incompetent. They would train you how to do it. If you say, like, I don't know how to talk to my wife about any of these different things, like, people don't. They don't want to they don't want to show you empathy and say, like, well, I don't know how to do that, too. But you need to put it out there because eventually you'll get connected with the right the right group. The second thing is when you leave the military, you need to be proactive. So I'll give you a for instance. When I came back from my first deployment, I didn't really know. I, everything was cool for the first several months, you know, like I was falling back in to like my life, I was reconnecting with my wife. And then I started having sleep problems. And then maybe I'd drink a little bit too much because I needed to sleep. So like maybe I need to drink to pass out, um, you know, whatever it might be. And um, I started talking to a counselor at the VA who was trying to help me kind of understand and stuff like that. And I started to get into a better place and then I deployed again. So when I came back or when I was about to come back from my second deployment, I committed even though I feel better, even though I think I've kind of learned how to deal with and address and identify issues as they come up, I'm going to be more proactive. And I'm just going to go back and start talking to this counselor again, because I think it would be better for me to do that um, than kind of just wait for everything to fall apart. So I think kind of to answer your question is like, you have to be honest and be vulnerable. You have to say, I need help or I don't understand. That will kind of get you linked up with people that are like going through the same stuff or have done that and they can guide you and coach you and mentor you. The other is you need to be proactive. So even when you think you have figured it out, you haven't because you're still living life and life is pretty dynamic. So you need to identify these things and say like, all right, now I think I need to just put myself back in this position and talk about it or get around people that are talking about it and listen to what they're saying, even if I'm not going to talk about it, hear their stories and say, Oh, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. You need to be active in that. I love, I love, so there's one of the themes, Anthony, that we talk about on my podcast with many dads, uh, we're in like season three, we've had, we'll be in, when this episode comes out, it's going to be anywhere between 160 and 170. So a lot of dads I've talked to, which is so cool to think about. And one of the, one of the words you said is I believe there's three superhero, superhuman powers we have, which is curiosity, humility, and vulnerability. Vulnerability, you know, sometimes the people will say, I'm sure you've heard about this as they say, wow, it's easy because some kind of wuss or weak for, Hey guys, military is our strongest people out there, at least my opinion. And he just said to be vulnerable. So like, if you have any other reason not to check your ego, because vulnerability is strength. Vulnerability is how we get better. No one's perfect. We all got gaps. John Kaplan, shout out to him. He told me, I remember this quote. I still remember it every single day. Casey, Casey it's, it's okay not to know every answer. It's just not okay not to do anything about it. I freaking love that advice because when I, when he told me that, I'm like, dude, this dude's a beast. Like I was so like inspired by this guy's experience. I'm like, wow, he's, and he still has gaps and he's still asking for help. So why the hell can I ask for help? So if there's mm -hmm. dads out there that you think you got, you're perfect or you don't, you want to look tough to your mom, your wife, your kid, your, whoever you is, you, you're not alone, dude. Like get help, ask for help. And for whatever reason it took this microphone in front of me, um, to have some amazing conversations with buddies that I played either I played football with shout out to uncle Rico right there or whatever <laughs> it might be, you know, and it's ridiculous that I, it shouldn't take a podcast for guys like me and Anthony, Sergeant Anderson to have this conversation it should be just go do it, put yourself out there. So anyway, well, so that vulnerability, but, but that vulnerability that you're talking about. So we're modeling the behavior that we hope to see, mm -hmm. right? So there's going to be people that to your other point about, you know, just being curious, they don't know 
Um, I think curiosity is great for leaders because it helps them find ways to innovate, whether that's in business or their own kind of, you know, personal life. But I think people are curious about how to find a way to make their life better. You just have to be, through your vulnerability, modeling the behavior that you hope to see. Um, People will see that and they'll say like, well, I respect that guy and he's talking about it or he's listening or, hey, they may just be, like I said, kind of that wallflower that doesn't want to actively engage, but they'll sit back and they'll listen and they'll hear you talk about this is where you go to find that solution. This is where you go to find that resource. And without engaging and letting you know, they'll then put themselves on that path. So certainly that vulnerability is huge because I think truly, I think one of the keys in life is we really just want to be connected. Like we fear being ostracized. We fear kind of being kicked out of the group all the way back. I think it's like in our DNA, like we want to be a part of you right. know, the village. We don't want to be kicked out. You got to be vulnerable with people. You have to demonstrate to them that you don't know everything, that you failed a thousand times before you figured it out. Um, and that like, you're still doing it. Like you don't mm-hmm. have it figured out. I think if you do that, um, especially in the military uh, kind of context where vulnerability is really looked down on when you say, I don't know, or I'm struggling with this because you fear people thinking that you're weak and incapable or incompetent, that good leaders will actually do that where there is no class on vulnerability in the military. It comes from your leaders showing like, yes, I miss my family. Yes, I can talk about this. Yes, that scared me when that bomb went off. Yes, I was a little worried about that. Like, It's okay to do that because otherwise what you end up doing is all of these things are happening and trauma is physiological, right? Like you feel it, you carry it with you. You don't know like, oh, what is that now? Like you're carrying it. You have this anxiety. If that person had just been vulnerable and said, yeah, I felt that too, you would be able to identify like, oh, okay, I get that. You can start working your way through it. So just my, my two cents on that. Mm, love it, ma'am. If you were to think back of your experience from both deployments and then the documentary, um, maybe to describe the, the biggest impact it's had on you as a father. Um, yeah, for sure. So I'm going to tie them both together. Uh, I was a young man when I went to Iraq the first time I was 21. I turned 22 while I was there. I went back when I was 24, it turned 25 when I was there. I was still very much developing. I didn't realize like biologically, um, I was still growing up. You know, I didn't know that. Um, so I didn't really know what to do with the lessons that I was learning. I didn't really know. I just kind of carried them. When I started walking, um, and I, and I really thought I could just outlast the bad feelings, if that makes sense. If, like, I can get through this eventually. I'll just get behind Tough it out. Let's go. We're good. Yep. yep. Suck yep. it up. Yep. When I was walking to California, um, one of the stories that I really try to tell is um, Tom and I were on um, uh, like a highway in Nebraska, walking from one town to another, and a car pulled over in front of us, I don't know, half a mile, a mile in front this would happen from time to time. And it was always nerve wracking because he didn't know what the person was doing. Um, were they just curious about who you were? Were they going to rob you? You didn't really know. Right. So as we started walking up, the guy pops out and he says, are you guys those veterans walking to California? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, cool. Um, I don't really have a lot of money. Um, I got 20 bucks. My brother died in Vietnam. Um, I want to be able to give you this money do whatever you need to do with it, put it towards the money you're trying to raise, buy socks, buy Gatorade, you know, whatever you got to do. Thank you for what you're doing. We talked to him for a couple of minutes and kept on going. But I started thinking about what he said, that he didn't identify himself as a veteran. He identified himself as the brother of a veteran um, who had died in Vietnam. So, you know, I presumed like 40 years earlier, but that war was still impacting him so much that he would go find two bearded idiots on the side of a highway in Nebraska and give them 20 bucks. That even though he himself hadn't put his own feet on the soil of Vietnam, 
that experience was still carried with him four decades later. And so I thought, well, man, if he's carrying the weight of this war four decades later, what am I going to be doing with the war that I actually experienced four decades from now? And so I started thinking about like, what am I going to teach my kids? And then what are they going to teach their kids? And then I started thinking like, well, there's going to be generations of my family that will never set foot in Iraq, will never serve in war, won't even meet me, but their lives are going to be molded by the lessons that I learned in war and then taught Madeline and then taught Hazel. And they're going to teach their kids and so on and so forth. And so to kind of answer your question, the experiences that I had that impressed, you know, on me lessons, I needed to try to figure out through this very like serendipitous meeting with this guy on the side of a highway, the value in determining which lessons I actually wanted to teach because those lessons were going to endure far beyond the lifespan of the war. Like that war is living forever in, um, in me because until I take my last breath, the war is alive in me and the lessons I learned in that war are going to be carried on by my kids and subsequent generations of my family. So really what I learned from them is I had the experiences in Iraq, but then the walk taught me that I had the opportunity to actually choose the lessons, the impact of those lessons and the context by which I wanted to teach them because the lessons are going to endure. Um, and so really that's one of the key things that I took away from that walk. And that was one of the things that I found to, I found, that it was an unanticipated consequence of the walk was the number of people I was going to meet that were going to like course correct me just a little bit or give me again, like that lens that I referred to earlier, an additional lens to see the world through. Um, I, I make this joke all the time. Um, and eventually I just decided I'm no longer going to try to look it up because then it takes the, the joke away. But there's a saying where it's like, if you put enough, monkeys and typewriters in rooms, you get Shakespeare. So just by virtue of these monkeys clacking out keys, you're going to get to be or not to be over time. Well, instead of me just clacking on keys over time, like I went to Shakespeare. I got to meet the experts that have lived my life, that have come to these understandings that are teaching me these lessons. So I got fast tracked. I didn't have to sit there and pound keys for 50 years. I got to go to the master. Um, and so I feel very fortunate having met all of these people, sometimes literally on the side of the road. Mm, that's so powerful, man. Um, I want to talk about, um, project welcome home troops and, sure. um, maybe share, share a little bit about, um, Tom and that project and meta and maybe then talk about a little about how the, the meditation also impacted. Um, sure. you know, cause I think that alone dads can get a lot out of this. Sure. So Project Welcome Home Troops, when you see Almost Sunrise, um, you're going to learn a few things, right? One of the primary uh, topics of Almost Sunrise is this uh, concept of moral injury, right? So generally, when people are talking about the trauma of a veteran, they're talking about things like post-traumatic stress, which is the clinical name for things that have been known forever, you know, battle fatigue, shell shock, soldier's heart. It's had a thousand names. Well, it was given a clinical name, post-traumatic stress disorder. We talk about that in Almost Sunrise, but we also talk about moral injury, which in its most basic sense is like being involved with witnessing, doing things that go against kind of your moral code, your moral compass. How we got involved with Project Welcome Home Troops, um, Tom... Uh, Tom Voss, who is an Iraq veteran, um, he and I worked together at um, a nonprofit in Milwaukee that was helping veterans. If they're homeless, had drug and alcohol problems, stuff like that. He, uh, he and I, when we did this walk, we had set um, a goal to do three things. We wanted to raise awareness to help veterans and their fam, or help, to help people understand the impact of war and coming home on veterans and their families. We wanted to try to raise. Um, at least $100,000 for this nonprofit in Milwaukee. And we wanted as peers to help one another along the way. Where Project Welcome Home Troops specifically came in is before we started walking, I volunteered 
to do a study at the University of Wisconsin in Madison on the threat stimulus of combat veterans. And so they would put me in an MRI tube for two hours at a time, and I would look at clocks. And one color of clock, I would not be shocked, and the other color of clock, I might be shocked. And so when I would see these clocks on the screen, they would look at my brain uh, waves to see how I um, anticipated a potential threat. And when we were done, um, with these studies, they taught us this mindfulness um, breathing technique, which incredibly powerful, right? Called the power breath. So the art of living is the civilian side of this. Project Welcome Home Troops is the veteran specific one. And so in summary, what this is, is when you think about your breath, uh, my teacher who you'll meet in the film, um, John, he said, you know, you think about your breath, most people really take it for granted, but when you do it for the first time, everybody cries. When you do it for the last time, everybody cries. And then in between, you're living your life. Like that is the power of your breath. And so think of your emotions and them being tied to your breath. When you're very calm, you breathe one way. When you're very excited or anxious, you breathe differently. So instead of allowing your emotions to change your breath, you're using your breath to change and draw out your emotions through specific cadences of breathing. And so they teach veterans this technique um, as a way to deal with and unlock trauma. So what you'll see in the film is um, some of these cadences, some of these techniques, um, and specifically you'll see Tom go through the course um, in Aspen, Colorado, they travel Project Welcome Home Troops. Well, pre-COVID, we travel all around the country, totally free. Um, few, you know, veteran, you know, four or five vets and their families wanted to do it, totally free. Um, I think now they do, I think they still kind of travel, but they also do them online. They're still free. But what you'll see in the film is an in-person version of this course um, and the power of it and how it impacted Tom um, and his healing and trauma from um, his time in Iraq. Yeah, is is so cool. I mean, I, I the, the the phrase "moral injury" really hit me. Um, and the stories I don't want to give away because I want people to go see, but like that, like hit me in the heart and just it, I envisioned it made me think about like when I went to the World War II museum in New Orleans, yeah. and I remember reading some artifacts of like a letter that was like they had kind of sh shown in like one of the thing little um, exhibits and it was like something I'm paraphrasing. It was like, Hey mom, it's me. I'm, I'm good. Um, I'm over here. I'm, you know, I'm scared at times. Hey, how does, did you get s sissy my bike? Like, like that, the thought of like, I'm being 16 years old or 18 year old or 20 years old and worrying about my bike to give to my sister. And I'm over here freaking in Afghanistan, like wherever you were, you know, where it's like, Oh my God, just, yeah. and then the moral piece of just like, you know, you're doing a, you're, you got over here for a job and that this, the moral mindset thing, you have to like the questions and things, I don't know. It just hit me in the heart, man. I am again, so honored you, Sergeant Anderson, you, you're here today with me and I get to hear this. Um, um, it just is. Well, it's, it's one awesome. of the questions that Tom and I were asked most. Um, so after, so when the film was released, it was released kind of more like, um, as a full, feature length documentary, like it would go to different film festivals around the country. So it was not uncommon for Tom and I to kind of just be like sitting in the audience, um, experiencing the film with people, or maybe we'd stand in the back and just kind of see, and you'd see like audiences, it didn't matter age, demographic, you know, whatever they would react very often at the same time throughout the film. Right. But, um, one of the common questions we were asked was, well, why doesn't this film get shown more at like the VA or like to government entities and stuff like that? And we would always say, because in order to do that, you know, you'd have to call into question the morality of war, which is very difficult to do, you know, when war is often put through the lens of right or wrong or good or bad, which again, when you see the film, you'll see one of the guys that Tom served with, his name is Emmett, talks about how very often in America, people put war through the lens of like world war two, like you get rid of a dictator, you get rid of an evil like entity. So there's always this very moral, like nobility um, that we're chasing, but sometimes the very nature of war, you know, in and of itself uh, isn't that. Um, and so we're there trying to 
fight and serve one another, but you're trying to tie it back to purpose, right? Because I mean, if that's what we're trying to do, if we're trying to be living purposeful lives, you're looking for a way to do that. Um, but when the purpose, when the why of the war is changing all the time, it's very difficult to understand, well, if I don't know what I'm doing here, why did I just have to see this person get killed? If I don't know why we're here today and it's different tomorrow, why do I have to go out and get blown up tomorrow? Like, tell me why I'm here. So that moral side, um, that is one of the difficult things to deal with when you're a young man or young woman deployed, um, that purpose, why am I here? What am I doing? Why are we doing any of this? Um, it's hard to get traction um, when that changes all the time. And so then it leads to a lot of just, again, moral conflict when you're then engaged with stuff, but you don't know why, like, why did I have to do that? Nobody can really tell me. I can't even tell myself, which in and of itself creates a new type of trauma that you then have to deal with. And what you see is that sort of trauma does not get medicated away. There is no pill that's going to do that. That is moral trauma. That's moral injury. Um, how you find the solution to deal with it is one of the most difficult things you can do in your life. But when you see the film, you'll see people who've gone through this or have mentored and coached people through it say, this is the key here. And it's not just through the breathing. There is one very specific thing, and it's the hardest thing to do uh, in your life. But if you can do that, you can get through it. Wow. Powerful stuff. Um, as we think about I'm getting ready to close here, as we think about one of the questions I always like to ask dads is um, in the spirit of which, you know, vulnerability and um, ways that we're working hard to become that ultimate leader of our home. Um, and then I told you before we, we record here, you know, I'll say it again. You know, people have heard this answer before for me. It, it's, it's patience. And I, you, I know we might have a similar answer, but I'll say it like patience is my gap being very competitive person in life. Um, I've had to really work on that and I work on it daily. Um, because a lot of times it's about meeting people where they are. And a lot of times, you know, it's not my kid's fault that I might be impatient. It's my fault. And so I've been really working hard on that over the last, you know, years of my life. But for you, um, tell me what comes to mind. I know your dad gave me wish was better. Well, so definitely patience. Um, like I was kind of mentioning to you, my patience issue is more like, um, it's slightly different. I'm sure you and I will, you know, feel similarly. I feel like my kids are very smart and very capable. And so I get impatient when, um, it seems like they're just not getting it, you know? And it's like, well, they haven't lived their life. They haven't gone through those failure moments, you know, yep. whenever we're at work and we tell, you know, a report, like it's okay to fail. I want you to fail, just fail fast and then learn. And then, you know, apply that and go, it's just crazy how I can do that at work, but I can't do that in my home. So patience in that context. But I think really what I need to work on is presence. Um, as I get older, I thought things would slow down, but they really just seem to get much, much faster. And I find myself um, setting expectations, but not meeting them. And so what I mean by that is like my daughter or my wife will say like, hey, we're going to do this or can we do this? And I say, yeah, I just need 10 minutes because I got to finish this thing. Um, I'm usually not done in 10 minutes. And then if I rush through it, I'm not very present in just getting like that. I think more than anything, if I could figure out how to be 2% better at that, you know, every month, um, I would really be living a better life. If I could figure out how to be more present for my kids and how to better put into context, like, you know, the presentation can wait you know, this can wait. Um, they're not gonna, they don't really care how I pared down 15 slides to three and made it, you know, really punchy. Uh, they just want their dad. So being present for them, I think it'd be much better. I love that, man. It, um, it's, I, I, the word that when you're saying that came to mind was grace. I think giving yourself <laughs> I don't grace. give myself much. Right. Well, I know most people don't, I think when, but the, being the power of vulnerability of our talk today, when we, when we give ourselves grace, even like having a conversation with your wife or kids about that, like I, I've like, 
I, I don't know. I thought it's not about that, but what you hit said also spoke to me about setting expectations and then not meeting them or setting expectations in my mind that are false, that people never, will never live up to. It's not fair. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. my fault. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think grace is, is, a. I feel like I've known you for a long time, dude, but if I, was, I don't know why, maybe cause I've seen the video, heard you on a podcast and I'm meeting you virtually here, but, uh, grace is a gift. It's hard to do, but it's a gift. Um, cause we, then you, and it made me think of Tom Brady's story. Tom Brady, I heard him on a podcast once. He said, do you want to be your best or no, it was Joe Montana. Do you want to be your best or the best? And he always said, I just want to be my best. I can't be the best. I can't control that. I want to be my best. So, um, when my son was call it, I don't know, 15 months old, I was like literally leaving at six. So I didn't get to see him before he woke up. I'd, I'd, I'd get home when he was at, you know, six 30, he, he's up for 15 minutes or maybe mm-hmm. half hour. I'm like, this sucks. My company loved it. Cause I was generating tons of dough for him, but I was, I had a great job, but all these things were great. But I was like, mentally I've sucked cause I didn't get to be with him. And I remember going to my boss and I told her, I was like, her name's Ange and Jeronica shout out to you, girl. I said this, I'm not my best version of me. And, uh, you're inspiring me to tell this full story. I don't know why I'm doing it, but I am. Um, and I asked, I said, I can't, this is not going to work if I'm not my best version of me. And you, you seen the work version of me, but at home, I'm not, I'm like, I'm freaking miserable. And she's like, leave it for I'm like, what do you mean? We're not a bank. I can't do that. She's like, why can't you? I'm like, I don't know. She says, I trust you're going to get it done. Just if you're available on the drive home, you got an hour drive, take the phone calls. But when you, from five to seven, shut it down. We're not that important. Like, unless until my phone changes to nine one one, I'm not that important. <laughs> you know, I was, yeah. Anthony, I was a number one rep of this company for 10 years, whatever, forever. They're still in business. They're still doing great. Uh, I don't get to talk to all those people anymore. They're still kicking ass. They don't need me. Like we're all replaceable. And I think once I learned that it gave, helped me give myself grace to like, you know, it's not, I know I can't get to everything, but if I'm being my best today, it helped me as a, you know, dad, as a, business leader. As a, I, I'm an executive sales coach now too for companies, but like, I don't know. And I had to go through that failure to, to be able to say that out loud. Anyway. It's a good story. Yeah. I appreciate you, it. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah, you bet. Um, okay. So if we were to try to summarize what, what we've learned today, all the wisdom, all the stories, um, we're going to get to lit here in a second, but what would be two or three actionable things dads can take from this episode of learning about your story and apply it to their own life to become that ultimate leader of their home. I would go back to, again, being vulnerable, model the behavior that you want to see. And then again, recognize that the lessons that you teach are going to outlive you and they are going to impact your community, your family, uh, well beyond. So very much like you just mentioned with, you know, being a great salesperson and having, you know, moved on and they're still doing great. Your impact, it's going to be what it is, right? But all the things around you are going to endure far beyond you. So choosing which lessons you hope to, to teach and the lessons that you hope to model, the behaviors that you hope to model, they are going to live far beyond you. So those I think are two probably probably really good lessons if you're trying to work on something. Be vulnerable and recognize the lessons that you're hoping to teach are going to last far beyond uh, what you think they are. They're not going to be just those moments where they say, "Oh, thanks, Dad," and they forget them tomorrow. They're going maybe one out of a hundred, but that one out of a hundred is going to get mm-hmm. taught to the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. So choose wisely, which lessons you are trying to teach. It's powerful. And when you slow down dads to think about that, think about that. If you could fast forward 200 years from now, you're a ghost, you're a spirit or you're wherever you are. And and you think about like, man, I, I taught my son that I taught my daughter that Mm -hmm. like, that's pretty powerful. And you you, that's maybe I had that vision. Like when you said that it's crazy, give me goosebumps. Um, okay. So I got a nice looking beard here. I must say myself, Sergeant Anderson, and I have it because I got some nice beard oil that uh, you sent to me as a sample, which I love. And I got some oak vanilla cherry. I got some chocolate coffee orange, smoky, woody, sweet, um, 
I got tux. I, and these are some sick stuff. So I didn't even know I, I didn't know I could even grow a beard by the way, until like six years ago and shout out to a guy named Ryan Lampy and then, um, Zach Smith. They're like, dude, you, you don't use beard oil. I'm like, no. So I was that tool that would be the guy with like freaking beard flakes and didn't even know it. So guys like you, we need it. So p- don't be me, but if it is me being vulnerable, don't be the guy with freaking beard dander. If you look like an idiot. So <laughs> talk to me about lit and how can people learn more about, uh, lit and, sure. and then talk about some of the, the, the $1 donation too. Sure. So lit beard company, uh, litbeardco.com. So lit beard company is, um, my beard oil business. I started with a couple buddies. Um, so it's veteran owned made in Wisconsin. We like to say brewed in Wisconsin since, you know, we're kind of, uh, like I was mentioning to you before culturally, but, uh, wax dipped veteran owned made in Wisconsin. So make my own beard oil, beard balm, beard wash, you know, t-shirts. Um, you can see it. I know your listeners can't, but, um, we make our own, you know, all sorts of merch, um, sell it on our website, have subscribers, stuff like that. Uh, there's a couple elements, you know, so I wax dip every bottle of beard oil because I want the experience to be very unique. Um, <clears throat> if, you know, you had said you're kind of newer to the beard oil or kind of beard grooming game, but you know, there's, 10,000 beard oil businesses out there. So how do you separate yourself? Well, I think you separate yourself obviously with great quality, but through your experience and then through the mission of your business. So, um, my beard oil, I wax dip it. Why? Well, it looks differently. So you have a different visual experience. You have the tactile experience of seeing and feeling the, uh, the wax, the vinyl, the sinew. You have the auditory experience when you pop the cork after you break through the wax you have the scent, the olfactory experience when you actually smell, like you said, the vanilla oak cherry of Wisco whiskey, you know, the smoky sweetness of Badger Bonfire, um, things like that, right? So I want that experience to be different. I want a world-class, you know, customer experience. So I hand write notes in every order. I let people know what I was rocking out to. Um, why? Because again, I think people want to be connected. And so when I started this business a couple of years ago, um, you know, a lot of people were really separated as a result of COVID. And I think everybody wanted to be back together. And so one thing that I've always really dug has been music. Um, I grew up listening to the music my dad listened to in high school. So Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, you know, things like that. And then I, as I started finding my own music that I liked, it was a lot of the bands that were inspired by those bands. So that music has always been a part of the experiences I've had. So I try to make that one of those kind of bridges to connect with the people that are buying the beard co. So personalized messages in every, in every order, uh, including what I was listening to when I was making your order. Um, it's actually been one of the cooler things is people will say like, well, that's my favorite band or that happens to be my favorite song or like, man, I can't believe you're digging that. I would, you know, I just listened to that song when people are um, giving me their reviews. So lit beard company, um, not only do I try to make a great experience and a great product for um, guys, you know, that want to take care of their beards with beard oil and balm and wash, but like you mentioned, um, I donate one dollar from every sale to Project Welcome Home Troops. So, as a veteran-owned business, it's very important to me that I help take care of veterans and their families. Um, yeah, we all take the uniform off, but I don't think our service really ends. Like I mentioned to you in the very beginning of this podcast service has been something that has been instilled, ingrained, driven into me since I was a kid. And so even though I don't wear the uniform anymore, I still feel very um, obligated and motivated to try to help veterans and their families. So $1 from every sale goes to Project Welcome Home Troops. So we can help continue uh, the mission of getting people that mindfulness, that meditation um, that you see in Almost Sunrise. It's very important to me and my friends that we do this. So Right now, my current scent, uh, Summer S'more. Why Summer S'more? I try to develop the scents that are important to the culture of where I'm from or experiences that are part of my life. So I love making s'mores with my girls during summer. So I created a beard oil that smells like a s'more. So it smells like chocolate and marshmallow. I made it into oil. I made it into balm. I love it. Helps my beard look, you know, baller, <laughs> uh, but it also smells good too. So, um, and those smells, I mean, think of, think of how powerful that is. Like 
when I smell, like when I go to my grandparents, I'm fortunate that my grandparents are still alive, but like when I go in and I smell like my grandma making pie, the like the memories that just flood back. It's very similar with these things. So again, like when I make something that smells like a s'more and I'm driving and all of a sudden I catch that whiff of like chocolate, I, I'm thinking of my daughters, like why I made this, those connections back. Um, I've had people actually reach out to me and say that the scent that's in something reminds them of like, I have one called Naughty List. It's uh, gingerbread and peppermint. I make it at Christmas time, but it reminded them of making cookies uh, at their grandparents. And so all those memories and so how powerful those memories can be from something as simple as just beard oil. So I dig it. My friends and I really enjoy doing it. We get to help people, you know, look good while we're doing good. Um, last year, we we were able to donate about 6,500 bucks, which was then matched. Um, and so every year I really look forward to being able to help out Project Welcome Home Troops. You know, we're just a small business trying to do good. Um, I'm down in my basement right now, which is where I do all of this stuff. Um, it doesn't take, you know, a big warehouse, you know, to be able to get out there. Um, and it certainly doesn't take a lot to try to, like, help people. You just have to have a willingness to do it. Love it. Well, I'm going to be a customer. I, um, I'm going to make sure my bearded friends are customers. I get a lot of friends of beards. Um Cool. We can make a special uh, code word for you. Yeah, there we, we go. We can make a, we'll do a like dad cast and we'll give a, we'll give like 15% off. I'll make, I'll make a discount code just for your listeners. Oh, there we go. I appreciate that. I, um, I uh, will make sure that's linked in the show notes, everybody. Um, uh, the experience, Everything he just described, everybody, it is true. It was a crazy experience. I mean, I, even the first one I got was just a, a sample, um, handwritten note. And um, uh, it's almost like, you know, I'm not trying to give too much love to Apple, but I think about it's like the Apple of beard oils. It's like it, it was definitely Thank unique and uh, it was um, stood out. And the marketing he's doing is, is, is smart and it's authentic and it, feels, it doesn't feel pushy. It just... Um, I'm a fan, so keep up the good work. Um, Thank you. now we go into what's called a lightning round where I go random and uh, a little bit of, um, the impacts of playing college football, uncle Rico, there we go. CTE brain where I just literally start asking random stuff. My goal is to get a giggle out of you. Your job is to ask, answer these questions as quickly as you can. All right. Are you ready? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> um, old Milwaukee or Pabst blue ribbon. Pabst. Whoa, that surprised me. Interesting. Okay. Uh, favorite Green Bay Packers win ever? Prob oh, man. Oh, there's so many. I'm fortunate. I'm spoiled. Um, <laughs> favorite one ever. Ever, 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 ever. You know what? Um, when Favre jumped into the end zone at County Stadium against the Falcons in like 94, it was like a head dive it got him into the playoffs for like the first time in forever i would have been like an 11 year old kid that would have been badass seeing brett Favre, young brett Favre, pre-mvp mm -hmm. brett Favre, diving in to get that uh that touchdown to beat the falcons and get us into the playoffs one of my favorite Favre is when he the monday night football game and his dad died and he just went bananas yeah, sure. that was yep. one of my favorites uh, 399 Favre. yards three touchdowns oh sick just crazy um far over rogers Roger, sorry. Wow. And the surprise again. I like it. Here we go. Um, yeah. True or false? Your host of the quarterback dad cast was in Lambeau Field for uh, Holmgren's debut return one November evening in 1999. True? True. I, I played football with a guy named John Kitna. And Kitna played against the Hawks. And uh, he got me tickets. And I went with a, these my buddies I worked with. For, they used to work at a company called Brady. Um, out in Wisconsin. So that was an amazing experience. The, the big joke that the Packers fans were saying is, hey, let's get this guy a latte. That was like the Seattle joke. <laughs> I'm like, if that's all you got, dude, I can take that all game long. Um, if you were, if I was to go into your phone right now and hear a song that your buddies might give you a hard time about, what would, what would, what would it be? Bad Romance by Lady Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite. So you're a little younger than me, but I'm gonna see if you got any eighties skills. Favorite eighties comedy movie. Would you consider Beverly Hills Cop a comedy? Sure. 
Oh, hell yeah. Beverly okay. Hills Cop. Okay. Favorite comic? Whole Axel Foley. Let's I go. just love it. That's one of the that's one of the movies that if I come across it, like I'm going through and it's on, like well, Done. I guess I'm Shut settling the up down. This. We're gonna watch some shows here. <laughs> um yeah. favorite if you're gonna book a vacation right now, where are you going? In America or the world, or can I just give you both? Wherever. You can go to Uranus if you America, want. America, Telluride, Colorado. Uh anywhere in the world. I've always wanted to go to Bhutan. It seems mm. like it would be a really beautiful Lots of snow-capped mountains. I really dig it. I like mountains, mountain uh, scapes. We got them in Seattle. Uh, if I was to come to your house for dinner, and it's a little later than you are right, where where you are, where I am right now. But like, tell me what we what would be what would we be having? Ribeye steak, cooked medium rare, with a couple uh, over easy eggs next to it, oh, uh, okay. so you can have a that like really rich yolk with it. Um, and then uh, my mom always makes killer uh, chocolate chip cookies. So I'd get some chocolate chip cookies from my mom as well. But definitely ribeye, definitely going hard on the protein. There we go. Um, okay. If there was a book to be written about your life, tell me the title. WTF. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you've already got a documentary, so we're going to pretend there's another movie. So WTF is now uh, making its way. It's in bookstores. Amazon picked it up. It's down in the airport. Everybody's reading it. It's like, oh my God, we got to make this into a movie. Hollywood hears about it. They do. Tell me who's going to star you. Everybody says that I remind them of uh, Jason Siegel. Okay. Jason Siegel. Okay. I was going to say, I, th- I was going to go maybe a little Jack Black with a tighter haircut. Uh, I mean, I'd be happy with that too. Um, I kind of get your voice got a little raspiness. I kind of hear some Jack Black, maybe because I listened to Jack Black <laughs> on a podcast today. Hey, I dig Jack Black. I, He's uh, hilarious. One of my favorite, one of my favorite times going out with my buddies, we went and saw Tenacious D way back in the day, like more than 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, that was a good night. <laughs> Do you know what D stands for? I don't. I learned that today. He was on the Smartless podcast. Tenacious D stands for defense. So it's Tenacious oh, yeah. Defense. But yeah, yeah. he said, I have he, heard him say that before, but he goes, I can't call it tenacious D because everyone thinks it's talking about a Dioc. <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh, good. Okay. Last question. And then lightning runs over. Tell me two words that describe your wife. Patient and tolerant. Sergeant Anderson, this is podcast has come to an end. If people want to learn more about you, tell me, how can I, how can I make that easy for them? Um, Yeah, I mean, so certainly watch the documentary Almost Sunrise. You can check it out on Amazon Prime. Just type in Almost Sunrise. There's tons of clips on YouTube and stuff like that, too. If you ever want to get a hold of me, uh, email me, Sergeant SGT, period, Anthony Anderson at gmail.com. I'm happy to do that. Um, Sign up, come over to Lit Beard Co., buy something. You're going to get a handwritten note from me. Uh, we'll be able to engage. I do text messages with my customers, all sorts of stuff like that. So watch the film, check me out, you know, at Lip Beard Co. Send me an email. If you have anything that you want to hear more about that we talked about today um, or a question that maybe we didn't cover, hit me up, Sergeant Anthony Anderson at gmail.com. Happy to uh, answer your questions. Love it. I will make sure all these are linked in the show notes. I want to say shout out to, uh, I don't, I don't hear about you. If um, John McMahon and John Kaplan don't have you on the Revenue Builders podcast, so um, shout yeah. out to those fine gentlemen for. Um, I didn't ask them for their for their for their if it was okay. I just I just did it because I didn't think it was a big deal. It's free free world, right? And I wanted to share your message right. and get it get it out there because people need to hear more about this about you and your story and, and obviously in, in your beard company project. Welcome home, troops too. Uh, I want to say shout out to Acme Homes, my boy Bob coming for your support of this podcast. And I also want to say shout out to um, Assam. I know we talked earlier today, buddy. We're in July when this episode will come out. It'll be soon. Uh, catch Sitka Seafoods. If you like seafood, please give them a shot. Um, my, I had the story I always like telling my daughter who was a, uh, she called herself a pizza-tarian. Uh, they, she, she even transitioned out of just loving pizza to loving fish. She loves their smoked salmon, their white fish. So uh, we're big fans of them, so give them a shot. They're 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 a small business that um, that battled through adversity of COVID, and they're still chugging along. Um, Sergeant Anderson, I'm honored. I'm so thankful our paths have crossed, and I'm so excited for people to hear your story, and, and hopefully we can 
support our troops to another level and also support litbeardco.com. Appreciate you, man. I appreciate it. Good talking with you. You too.